All right, guys, Mike and Brad here from Office of the CISO, and today we are going to be discussing cyber liability insurance, uh, our personal opinions on it, as well as the kind of the path that we have seen it take as of late. And that's going to also transition us into uh, some doom and gloom for 2023 through 2025, if you will. So stay tuned and we'll get with you. All right, guys, good to see you again, talk to you again. Do us a favor, as always, please post comments in the comment section below. We like these things to be organic. Um, last time we had a discussion, right, we were talking about the United States investment and how it's growing with regards to uh, cybersecurity and some of the stuff that we're seeing in the industry, Yeah, which was pretty nice. Um, Today we're going to kind of pivot a little bit based on that conversation and and dive into like cyber liability insurance, um, specifically the path that we have seen it take from a professional standpoint because we've seen it from the beginning, as well as where we probably see it going or not going in the future. And then, of course, um, a little bit of discussion about uh, – what the World Economic Forum believes will happen within the next two years. And uh, spoiler alert, it's kind of like COVID, but not <laughs> for people or beings. So it'll be interesting to to kind of unwrap that. And I didn't see think we you go. were going to bring that up in the middle of this. Yeah. That's so, awesome. So, Brad, we've, we've been around a good bit. We've right. seen our fair share of cyber liability insurance brokers, underwriters, things of that sort. And uh, we've seen them pay out or not pay out um, based time and on time, again, yeah. time and time again based on cybersecurity events. Now, when it first came out, it was fairly easy to get a hold of, and the prices were really, really good for the coverage that they provided. So yeah, yeah, that's that, that's one thing that that I, I did I did notice that the the coverage was really good. The um, if you did have an event, they were a lot more willing to pay out to cover the event. Um, and the, um, the cost was, was reasonable when, when, uh, you'd work, we, we'd work for some larger organizations that would get insurance mm -hmm. and the premiums that we'd see, we'd go, gosh, those are kind of high because we're used to paying car insurance premiums and house insurance premiums. But, um, at, at the time really looking at it, Peanuts. it wasn't that bad. Yeah. It's, it's, it was actually a still at the time. Yeah. Yeah. For the, for the amount of coverage and the the wild nature of security incidents, um, it, it was. It was a steal. Absolutely. So when it first came out, <clears throat> at least from my opinion, cyber liability insurance companies and the underwriters that supported them maybe got a little overzealous. Uh, the forms to qualify were one-pagers that didn't right. cover much. You know, do you have antivirus? Do you run a firewall? Yeah. Very, very bland stuff. Vague language that didn't really have a whole lot of meat to it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things that they really couldn't pinpoint or hold you to um, because it was easy to answer yes mm -hmm. to all these do yous. Yeah. Their question points are vague enough to where you could say yes and you wouldn't actually be lying. Yeah. <laughs> um, you fast forward a year after they started offering them and, you know, they had to start paying ransoms. They lost their ass. They yeah. lost so much money. Well, that and like they, uh, if if an organization would have an, an event where data was exfiltrated, mm -hmm. they ended up ended up having to cover um, what was it like one hundred and fifty dollars per individual whose information was was lost. Yeah, and that's just for things like LifeLock or yeah. credit monitoring of some sort yeah. to make sure they're safe, right? Right, so. right. Yeah, and so that that could get wildly out of control because if you consider. Um, so like a, a medium-sized doctor's office, for instance, mm -hmm. they may have a few thousand patients. Easily. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, 150 bucks. I don't, hadn't, hadn't done the math on that, but that's a, that's a lot of money for a small-time operation. And then you expand it into, like, state governments that, that keep up with uh, licensees and um, benefits recipients. And, and things oh, like yeah. that. And the numbers just get catastrophic for these organizations. So for your 
like your specific use case there, you said specifically a medium sized doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Um, a medium sized doctor's office has maybe 3000 patients. Okay. Because whenever you spread it out with scheduling and everything in order for them to say, stay fully scheduled, you're looking at between three and 5,000 patients. Okay. Um, at $150 a pop, if that data were to be exfiltrated and put out on the dark mm -hmm. web and they, and the organization was responsible for it, that all of a sudden you're talking about $450,000 of liability. Yeah. Just for the doctor's office. And that's just for credit monitoring. Of the individuals. Like yeah. Yeah. That doesn't pay for remediation. That's not part of the remediation. The mitigation of whatever vulnerability it was that, that allowed the, the attackers to uh, to take over the, the environment. I mean, all, all that plays into it, and it can balloon really fast. And I think that's what, what drove the cyber liability insurance providers in the direction that they've gone in the past few years. You, you've seen that like the questionnaires become longer over the past couple of years. Go in from one page to seven. Yeah, yeah, with add-ons. Modifiers, right, riders, right, just right. like standard health insurance and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, so you can get li liability insurance, but if you want ransomware coverage, oh, that's a different, that's a whole different thing. Uh, so the, the, the question sets, the, the, they've become longer. The questions have become more pointed. They, they're more black and white um, to where if you say yes to something, they can come back and prove that your answer really was no and that you lied on that thing, and then they don't have to pay out. But they get to keep the premium. Right, right. Which is, is scary um, because you become reliant on that transfer of risk. So that's what you're doing when you buy insurance is you're transferring risk to the insurance provider. Well, if they all of a sudden come back and find some minute detail that makes them not, what's the word, culpable? <laughs> is that what mm -hmm. I'm going for? Uh, then all of a sudden you're burdened with this big bill that you don't have the money for. That's why you got insurance in the first place. Playing devil's advocate, I actually agree with the the insurance side of things, and yeah, we usually do on this one. Just don't commit insurance fraud and lie oh, on your gosh. application, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, I've seen organizations check off that they have endpoint detection and response. I've seen folks say that they have one hundred percent multi factor authentication, knowing good well they don't. Yeah. And then a breach comes in through their manage engine desktop support <laughs> portal yeah, and uh, they expect insurance to, to cover it all. And this was a big organization that I'm talking about, not even mm. state government. This is a, this is a big time uh, holding company. Yeah. And the insurance company told them to, to kick dirt, you know? <laughs> <'Cause>, oh my gosh. <laughs> and they had to pay the cost to remediate. So they had to get all their servers back online. They had to pay all the consulting fees for organizations like us to come in at right. ex, ex, astronomical mm -hmm. cost per hour because that's incident response is yeah. a high dollar It's thing. very, very high. Uh, if you get people that are actually willing to come in and deal with your thing, I mean, we've gotten to where we don't even assist with incident response in a lot of cases because it's just not worth it. Um, and they had to out-of-pocket all that. Thank God they had enough gross margin to cover it because it would have been bad. Um, but how so, long did it take them to recover from that? A month. A month. Oh, my we, gosh. We got them back up and running within a week and a half. This is during holiday season, their busiest season. Oh, geez. So we got them back up and running, but they were limping along. Mm -hmm. They were doing a lot of processes manually and a lot of oh, people putting in like 18-hour days. So. Yeah, that's super painful. So you think about the, the lost revenue from that, the mitigation costs, the monitoring fees. It's, it just it gets out of control really fast, which – Again, like you're saying, it helps me understand where the where the insurance providers are coming from. Um, but I think some of it may be that, and, and this is an experience that I've got working with some some uh, some clients. The questionnaires aren't always clear what they mean. They may they may reference a technology that the 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 uh, the company is unfamiliar with, so they're not really sure how to answer it. So of course we get we get brought in on, brought in on that to discuss the the questionnaire with them um, to help guide them and help them understand what technologies they do have versus the ones that they don't. Um, but if if there's an organization that doesn't have a resource that's a, a security uh, subject matter expert, I could see them committing this insurance fraud accidentally. 
Yeah, you definitely. Or uh, you, I've seen this, especially with state agencies. Yeah. Um, the questionnaire says that you need a password account manager or a PAM or mm-hmm. something like that, a privileged account manager. Privileged access manager, yeah. And they're like, okay, let's buy it and deploy it. You know, letting the letting the cart right ahead of the horse, right. letting your insurance dictate what your organization your, should be rating and determining whether or not you want to accept it or deny yeah. it. Or you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then that's that's a fair point. Letting your insurance drive your security strategy. Mm-hmm. That's never the way that it should be. And and a, like the PAM that you're bringing up, privileged access management is a very difficult technology to really take advantage of. I mean, you almost need, depending on the size of the organization, it's not just the cost of the tool; it's the cost no. of the person to run it because it takes a person. Yeah, it sure, it sure does. And then you've got to build all of your administrative processes into that tool so that the tool can be useful and actually protect those administrative processes. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, and one one of our clients had had talked about bringing it in. It was a very complex environment that they that they worked in. Um, and they viewed it like that, Pam, you just bolt the Pam on, bam, and it's done. Like a rubber stamp. Right, right. We're situated. And then we sat down and started talking it through because I was like, well, don't go spend money on it just yet. Let's talk it through and see what this actually means. So we're talking about now breaking off the the administrative workstations into their own environment, separate from the workstations that the guys use to check email and surf the internet. And then you've got to tie in all the technologies that have administrative accesses, all those little bitty things. And then you got to make a decision like that on the fly just to figure out whether or not you're going to get cybersecurity insurance. What I don't did, know. Microsoft called it something like Red Domain, Red Forest. It was the Red Forest was the old concept. You know, it was like the administrative domain, and right. our security rep at the time was an amazing person. Yeah. And then he unfortunately passed away. What was it? Uh, David Upton. David Upton. Yeah. So if uh, if you're watching and your work for Microsoft, David Upton was one of your better cybersecurity people. Quite. And quite. he loved music. And yeah. So we're, we're still we're... sad that he's not around. <laughs> yeah. He was a pal of mine. We yeah. got him. So, but yeah. So we have cyber liability insurance companies that are mm. growing their things from one page down to seven plus the riders and the, the additional applications. And we're starting to see a lot of you can tell that the insurance companies hired folks like us to come up with possible points of entry. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Certainly. how can a company normally get popped? Well, you know, it's almost always credential stuffing. We saw recently with PayPal, they got credential stuffing. Or Sorry, it's not always with credential stuffing, but things like credential stuffing happen and they're quite common. Right. Because, uh, you know, you have LastPass that got compromised and then their parent company got compromised as well. <laughs> Encrypted backups. And the key, but I digress. <laughs> Actually, so, I, I didn't know that that's what caused the. That's how they lost their data. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, they lost their data, but but PayPal got compromised due to credential yeah. stuffing. Yeah, which is where you're just taking you know data that was received from other means, other hacks or things right. like that, right? And then just trying them. Bombard people it, do yeah. not. We don't use multiple passwords usually. We have very small brains when it comes to being inconvenienced with having to remember multiple things. So we is dumb. Yeah, that's we keep fair doing enough. Stuff, so. so, you know, you have applications that are like, do you have multi-factor authentication? We're like, absolutely. That should be day one anyways on anything mm-hmm. of importance. But then they're asking, is it multi-factor for remote access? Well, yeah. Is it multi-factor for elevated prompts elevated like, privileges yeah okay there we go so right I, that's a little more if difficult. i run as admin all of a sudden you know you're having to buy something like duo or yeah. some you know equal technology that can do mm-hmm. that and then it's like well okay well what about you know this that and the other and they're basically trying to find ways to put multi-factor on everything which is nice yeah, yeah and if you if you end up getting uh, um an application that's a bunch of yeses you pretty much don't need the cyber liability insurance anyway it's a good stop gap just in case but for that one time the person gets the request and they hit approve when they yeah. didn't enter their credential yeah 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 what's that happens admins wake up tired in the middle of the night with prompts all the time I, I, don't, I don't know though that's one of the one of the things i have a bit of a hang up with though if if you're going to answer yes to all this stuff you have a really good security posture as it is you start weighing the risk at that point well yeah and, and if you and the cost of mitigate or defer that risk right right and if you do go through okay so if you do go through the questionnaire and you have a bunch of no's then you're going to get a premium that's through the roof 
if if they'll even give you one. Right, right. So that makes me that makes me wonder: Would it be better to take that money and put it into your security program to to bolster your security and not go for the insurance? Ooh, yeah, that's, right. So that's that's another <laughs> thing. We're not just talking cyber liability insurance companies aren't just pinpointing technical controls either. They're asking in our latest round. Oh yeah, they're asking for policy and procedure. Yeah. and they want you to have an enterprise information security program, right. which I'm not going to lie. We've been preaching that for years. <laughs> it's the right way to do it because that's what sets your standard. But it's but, hard. I mean, that's really difficult. And if you don't have the resources to put into it, it's never going to happen again because it's difficult. It's, I mean, it's difficult for people that are good at it. Like, sure. I've, I've watched you glaze over many a time. <laughs> I got to stop and catch my breath from like, typing. Ah. Yeah, I know. So I know. Um, so I know one, so security program is one, like the t- top level policies and procedures. Another was change management. They were real heavy about change management processes. Well, I mean, they don't want people installing stuff without having multiple eyes on it for integrity. Right, right. And that's all, all fair enough, which I've seen a lot of the, some of the financial audits we've gone through to focus on change management. That, that's a kind of a topic for, for the financial industry and the insurance guys as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, they've evolved, like we said, from, yes, we'll insure you, mm-hmm. hear this, to where they, they lost their butts and they had to to figure out that, you know, we can't pay out all the time. And people were, their clients were getting really, really fly by the seat loose when it comes to checking yes on these things that they couldn't verify with artifacts or whatever. Or they would just, oh, we're, we've deferred it to the insurance company. We don't care as much. Yeah. And then... I think it kind of played hand in hand with the ransomware costs skyrocketing anyways, because all of a sudden um, criminals, cyber criminals that maybe previously would not have done this. All of a sudden they're like, like when someone, all these riots and stuff that take place across the country, right? Mm -hmm. The, The one thing that you hear people that aren't around say is, well, those companies are insured. And that comes often. So now you have cyber criminals that are like, yeah. they're insured. I'm more likely to attack them because I won't hurt them as bad. It's the cyber insurance companies that get it. Except that it's, it's I could see that being I a I could see that being a, men- a mentality. Yeah. 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 Well, a way that they rationalize. that's how people are. Yeah. Well, and that's a, the criminal mindset, too, is they're going to rationalize everything they can um, mm-hmm. to push themselves to do the things that they're going to do. Got to make this money. Yeah, and there's a lot of money in it. Um, do we want to pivot to the yeah actually, World Economic so, Forum? <laughs> so that that's actually a perfect. That is actually a perfect pivot point yeah, for us. The money that's in cybercrime. So crime. the money that is in cybercrime. So in 2015, the uh, the value of cybercrime was roughly 3.5 trillion dollars. And they are expecting, according to the World Economic Forum, who I don't always trust because when you put a bunch of rich white people in the same room, <laughs> they tend to think they need to run and govern and take over the world. Tell all of us what to do, yeah. Especially from Davos, wherever. But mm-hmm. uh, that's a whole other conversation in itself. Um, they had a security report for 2023 where they're basically drilling down and talking about where they see things happening in the future. Mm-hmm you know, past things and they're expecting by 2025 for it to be like 10 and a half trillion dollars. 10 and a half trillion dollars, a 10 and a half trillion dollar, trillion dollar industry. Yeah. And that's, yeah. yeah, that's worldwide, obviously. And that's a pretty big deal because those cyber liability insurance companies are going to be the ones that have to pay that toll Yeah, or go under or the businesses themselves will as well. But, so, um, so to put that in perspective, that's the trend. That's the direction that the the cyber crime industry is is headed towards. It's ten and a half trillion dollars by twenty twenty five. If it hits that, and if cyber crime was a nation state, it would be the third largest. Uh, what is that? Gross domestic product, uh, or what? It'd be the third largest company by GDP. It'd be the third largest nation as far yeah. as G- yeah by by GDP. Yep, those words. Mm. <laughs> economics yeah, yeah so it's big business that's, now that's huge man and so one of the, some of the things that we end up finding ourselves talk about as cybersecurity experts is at what point in time as a nation 
any nation, not just the U.S., does offensive security start paying bigger returns, but then you also have to consider that the threat actors that we go against are doing the same thing, right? So you got to keep your blue team <laughs> on point. Um, yeah, and as soon as you figure out a way to defeat one of the one of the attackers' mo's, they'll figure out a way to defeat your defense. Yeah. So it, it's a cat and mouse game, and it always will be. Didn't didn't the FBI recently take over? Was it the Hive? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, That's, so they used offensive tech specifically to. Yeah. Yes. There's a there's a third article that that we uh, that we've got in here. That we'll, we'll include all the links and everything that talks about the FBI breaching the Hive ransomware environment. That's right. And yeah. living in it for a a, ma- a matter of months, ga- gathering intel against those guys and uh, and their uh, um, I don't know buddies cohorts. <laughs> yeah, cohorts. That's good. I mean, to be honest, the FBI probably wrote the damn software anyway. She had to but, guess, yeah. But so, I mean, that's worth knowing. You know, our country's doing offensive stuff. But one of the things that really stood out about the World Economic Forum post mm-hmm. or uh, article, report, because yeah. they had to report at the, the big convention they do, they're specifically, and I think they called COVID ahead of time, which was at the entry <laughs> level, my little jab about that. They were like, we're going to, suffer from a pandemic they are coming out and saying that we're going to suffer from another pandemic of electronic form that's much worse than covid but it's just digital yeah Yeah. so it doesn't i think they said something along the lines of this one won't attack your body or your person but it'll attack your organization your country and everything that we rely on which i mean yeah your electricity and your water and your food yeah all those great things which takes us back to that previous one talking about critical infrastructure that we did yeah certainly so certainly i mean where do we what well, the possibility is there the possibility is there um but in, in so in my opinion that the article talks so it's a popular mechanics article that's quoting this world economic forum published uh, mm-hmm. publication or whatever they start off talking about cybercrime and money the money that's in cybercrime so much we're in the wrong we're on the wrong <laughs> side of the <laughs> I don't know. My conscience keeps me from doing that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like to feed my kids and not worry about going to prison. Um, but so they, they, they start out the article talking about money, but then it gets into this this thing about this uh, digital pandemic, this virus that runs out of control, that self-replicates and self-mutates and all that stuff and just wrecks everything. I don't see that being something that the cybercrime industry that's interested in money I don't see them doing that. That's not what I see them. That may be a cyber terrorism thing. I think you got the hacktivists and yeah, that that's where I would see that political more agenda with. or yeah. right religious agenda or any kind of agenda outside of dinero, right? Right. So right. So the cyber crime guys that are looking for for money, you can't get money off of wrecking everything and destroying everybody's electricity and water. You can unless get, you're the company that fixes. Well, it. Well, I mean, there's that. There's that. You can go to war because of stuff like that. Um, In which case, the U.S. makes money. Right. <laughs> Dang it, man. <laughs> With the war machine. Right. But I, I, I don't know. I just, I just don't think that the, the ones that are out for money are going to be the ones that destroy the infrastructure. They may cause like a ransomware event to get an electrical company to pay them to unlock their stuff. But wrecking everything in the world isn't going to benefit those cybercrime guys. So – if you believe the conspiracy theorist, Uh-oh. which as of late, conspiracy theories sure do get proved <laughs> right a lot more than we would like to admit. COVID-19 came from a lab in Wuhan, and it was intentionally unleashed on the oh, world. Oh, that's the conspiracy theory. Yeah, by, okay. the, by all the big money folks. Yeah. Because, you know, two years before, they said in the next two years, we're going to have a pandemic. And whether or not that's true or not, you know, we'll never know. We're peons. We're peasants. But all of a sudden, you got the same rich white dudes saying that we're going to have this cyber event. They already have all the money they need. That's now they enough. just need to thin the herd and make it to where they can control us even more, right? Yeah, but so this, that's one angle. This stuff they're talking about is going to wreck the financial industry as well. So it'll end up locking them out of all their they're liquid beyond assets. Money. Uh, fair enough. I mean, Bill Gates is beyond money. When, when you when you bathe in I don't know gold, it's a different thing. They got. I was, I was reading an article about this one billionaire that like. 
he sold some website for billions. He was an econ guy. He's like 45 now, and he spends like $2 million a year to maintain like the athleticism of an 18-year-old, the skin of a 25-year-old, hmm. blah, blah, blah. It reminds me a little bit of Patrick Bateman from American, American Psycho. Psycho. <laughs> at the beginning, it's like, I can do a 1,000 now. Talking about his sit-ups and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so these guys start... They start thinking once they have all that money that it's bigger than money, which it is. Life is bigger than money. It's uh, it's about know. business cards. It's about business cards, gold laced ones <laughs> with bone. <laughs> was that what it was? Oh, and that font. Right. Oh, that's hilarious. That's one of my favorite movies. So, yeah. So they're coming out. We we kind of went on a tangent there, but <laughs> they're coming out and saying that you know there's going to be this giant cyber event over the in the course of the next two years. Two years, of yeah. course, is always in the next two years. And right. it's going to cripple infrastructure, both critical and non-critical. But I think you will find that if you take TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat away from our youth, there will be chaos because they're broken. Oh, my broken. gosh. That's a good I point. can't get on Fortnite. Mm-hmm. You know? So <laughs> it, it, it very well may happen. And if that's the case, the cyber liability insurance companies will be broken out of money, not covering any of it. So, uh, Yeah, it'll be, it'll be well beyond that at that point. Okay, so you touched on this earlier. Um, you mentioned the concept of offensive security. Yeah, red team. Yeah, uh, maybe we do it every day. Yeah, 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 yeah. As, as a response, we, we do it every day in like penetration testing and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you you mentioned it as as potentially a response to this um, catas- uh, catastrophe that uh, the World Economic Forum is talking talking the about. The catastrophic cyber event of twenty twenty five. Right, if it happens two years. We can from go now. ahead and put that on our calendars, I guess. It's the new 2012. Yeah. <laughs> Again, yes, 08 and 2012 all wrapped up in one. Um, so, and we talked about the FBI taking over the Hive ransomware and yeah. um, infrastructure, their environment. Do you think that that is a proper response to to something like what the World Economic Forum is talking about? Should we go on the offensive, or should that make us build up our defenses even more? You know, for. Sports analogies, the best defense is really good offense. Wait, swap that. Score points. Swap that. Reverse it. Swap best offense is a good defense, yes. Uh, it, well, it depends on who you are. <laughs> the offensive guys will be like, I can just always score more points, right? Fair enough. So I think red team and blue team aren't going away. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the – proper one because all you got to do is make the wrong people angry and then all of a sudden you have a bigger target your on your target, back than you yeah. already did yeah but also i'm a firm believer that if you can score more points than the other team it doesn't matter how many they're able to score as long as you can do more right yeah it's like if a nuclear war happened yeah they might hit their buttons first but we have more buttons more more <laughs> bombs we could take them out yeah yeah. So it really depends on how prepared we are as a nation or how prepared our allies are as a nation to, uh, one, have the cybersecurity professionals necessary to execute an offensive, an offensive program operation like that. like that. Yeah. Which, I mean, we talked about them up and funding with uh, DHS and DOD and, DOD and all that. And they're right. talking about bringing on, you know, five more critical mission teams. Yeah, that's true. For cyber. That's so, true. Um, I mean, hell. Defense is offense if you look at it. We have the Iron Dome over in uh, Israel, right? As yeah. missiles are coming in, it's shooting them down. Right, lasers and all. And yep. you, using guns to stop guns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. It happens, yeah. I I think it's going to be on a case-by-case basis, <clears throat> and it's going to depend heavily on who the other actor is. Do you think that the that the nation will, our nation, America, would? United States. I know a lot of. Our viewers are from abroad. Yeah, yeah. So do you think that the United States would one day consider those cyber attacks as an act of war? I think we're already there. You think so? I did a lot of DOD contracting, and we had drills on the regular talking about, Hmm. you know, they compromised the base. Well, it's just a baby one. Uh, There's levels that they have to go through, right? You have to prove that, one, it was a state-backed action. Fair enough, yeah. Because just because it was a Chinese IP does not mean it was China. It was China, yeah. It could have been some kid with way too much free time on his hands. Just Mm -hmm. like, and the same is true for us. Right. I mean, how many kids are in their basements wanting to be Mr. Robot from TV? And so they're, you know, 
looking at some German server and they compromise it and it comes from an American IP. And all of a sudden so, Germany's ticked off, yeah. Yeah, and you don't want the Germans mad at you. But, I mean, think about it. They are they always want to do it for street cred and clout, but the, the governments always have to take it through a process to say, you know, was this a state action? What was actually done? Could it just be a mischievous team? Yeah. So... I mean, we had levels of, of hoops to jump through before we were like, bad, let's go get them. So did the DOD really put a lot of effort into root cause and um, attribution and that kind of thing? Yeah. yeah they did? Yeah. No, okay. we, we, did, we did heavy stuff. We did. It was cool. Like, that was my first experience with Splunk and seeing the level of detail of logging yeah. and things like that that we could get. Uh, that was my first enterprise organization of that size. Because there is no bigger organization than the U.S. government being gangster, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that they might say it, but the cool stuff that we were able to see, there's no way that the secret stuff isn't infinitely way cooler. Yeah, it's like you know what? I will bring a twelve pack of beer, <laughs> some Cheetos. Let's let's have at it because it'll be fun. But, I yeah. watched the Fringe. I know. Mm. I haven't seen that. I'm gonna jump on it. Yeah, it's a good show. So, but yeah, you know, if a giant thing takes place, we're going to be in a situation where offensive might be necessary just because it'll, at that point it'll be an all-out war and we may not know who the other side is. Yeah. If it's mutating like that, right? Yeah. I mean, we have a pretty good idea. It's the guys at the World Econo- Economic Forum that are scheduling it. Rich, old, white people. <laughs> it's not the rich, old, white people that are doing the, the malware development. I'll tell you that. No, nope, some kid that they got locked in the <laughs> right. locked in the basement. That yeah, when they're bored, they go down there. And, never mind. Yeah. So yeah, um, cyber liability insurance, man, it has gone from its infancy to actually being pretty resilient with how they approach things. I don't think it'll necessarily stick around long term, mainly because of the point you made, right? By the time you've invested all the checkboxes yeah. to make your rate acceptable, you might as well just accept the risk and know that your security posture is uh, good enough. Right. Uh, and at that point, w- you may as well just self-insure, right? Yeah. So, so If you can, yeah. If you can. Um, if the big thing that Wef was talking about happens, I'm he, not worried. I got 10 acres, guns, and canned goods. I'll be safe. Yeah, he, he said that I didn't. I lost all my guns in a boating accident, actually. Yeah, and you were carrying both of our guns at the same time. God, so yeah, thanks for losing all that, my guns. Yeah. That stupid little aluminum boat, man. <laughs> mm. It sank, too, and you it barely sank. swam out of there with your life, right? Yeah. yeah, my shoes almost weighed me down. I lost yeah. them, too. Um, so, you know, offensive security is fun. Our country is doing more and more of it. Your country is, too, if you're not from the U.S. Uh, hopefully, we're on the same team. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Um, that's about all I have for today, man, you know. Yeah, me, me too. I mean, the, the articles are pretty interesting. We'll post the articles. Do us a favor. I know I say this every video. Read through the articles after watching the video. Um, one, uh, the articles that we posted we thought were useful to cybersecurity experts or just people that are interested. Yeah. But even better is it's going to give you some perspective on what we were reading based on some of our analysis on in conjunction with our expertise. And then, of course – comment and let us know what your thoughts are so that we can start building conversation that way. Yeah. We'd like, we'd like to hear it to get your opinions on some of these articles. And, uh, if you have differing opinions from us, we'd certainly like to hear it. Um, especially the reasoning. Oh yeah. No, we, we are not the type of people that think our opinion is the only opinion. Um, we certainly are strong in our opinions and we're very direct with them, but we listen to facts Yeah, and we base or change our opinions based on those. So if you have another perspective, we certainly look forward to hearing it. Yeah. We've been in this long enough to know that... We can be wrong. Right. (laughs) More times than we're right sometimes. Yeah, yeah, often. But anyways, there you have it. Cyber liability insurance, it's growing up. And the world's (laughs) going to end in two years because of a cyber virus, but we'll see how we do. Do us a favor. If you like the video, hit the like button. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. And as we just said, comment below. We want to hear your opinions, your thoughts, and and how you see things. Um, until next time, y'all stay safe. Okay.